part of what I do when I teach is I share my perspective on working in the music industry. And more specifically, how do you earn a living in the music industry, right? Most people don't think about it or they think that they'll get gigs that will su support them. And that's just not true today. I mean, who's working doing gigs right now? Nobody um, playing live gigs. So that just shows you how tenuous that whole paradigm for making a living is. And if you look historically at the music industry, 35, 40 years ago, there were a fair amount of pick up orchestras in the city if you were an orchestral player where you could freelance and living was cheaper then and you could play with three or four pickup orchestras and sub on Broadway and maybe you played as an extra with the New York Philharmonic or Orpheus if they were around then or St. Luke's and maybe you were in the New York Pops and you could or and you played at the ballet and you could cobble together a living and you would supplement that with recording studio work during the day. There were quite a few large recording studios and music for media needed live players for the most part back then. And then as you fast forward to now, all those scenes back then, recording studios, live concerts, um, playing on Broadway, all those things back then have shrunk the amount of work there is. So that just being a player is no longer really an option. When I was an undergraduate, which was from 1978 to 82 at Queens College, the cost of living was dramatically cheaper. I had an apartment near the college, just on the other side of the expressway um, in the basement of a, a single family, like a, a, an attached home. And I was paying a hundred and thirty or hundred and forty dollars a month for rent. And you know, if you're sharing an apartment now with somebody, you're pl paying over a thousand, you know, a thousand dollars a month rent minimum. Um, so that alone, right? The cost of food was cheaper. The cost of gas was cheaper. The cost of insurance was cheaper. Um, cost of health insurance was cheaper. Everything was cheaper. So. When I was going to college, I was playing with people that were, I was playing at night in club bands, playing in top 40 bands, playing weddings. Uh, Dr. Smaldone, also, he's a few years older than me, uh, and he, he uh, was doing that also on the weekends, playing in club date bands. I did a little bit of that, uh, the wedding scene, um, but I mostly played in bar bands, top 40 bands, funk bands, pop, pop bands, rock bands, blues bands, whatever I could get. Um, and, you know, on a good night, we'd make 50 bucks. And most nights playing in a bar, we'd make 20 or $25. And on the weekends, if I played a wedding, I'd make 75 to to $100. And then there were guys that actually were doing this much more full-time than I was that were making, you know, fifteen to $20,000 a year playing gigs. And the cost of living was cheap enough back then that they could actually sustain themselves by working in clubs, right? Well, the, the pay's gone down and the amount of work has gone down, but the cost of living has gone exponentially up. So the gig, the gig um, economy has its limitations. You know how they say that uh, with, the, with the amount of record sales or CD sales or download sales down, that people make their living touring, right? Well, that's not an easy life. And then again, you see we have this insane situation now with COVID. Those people aren't working anymore. So what are they doing? So how do you generate income in any business? You have something with that, and you get it in the marketplace where there's a demand for it. You create something that has demand and you get it into the marketplace, right?
You could even create things that people don't even know they need. And next thing you know, they can't live without them. Like a phone with a camera in it. Now the camera's more important than the phone. Um, an iPod. You know, Apple invented these things and, and there was uh, everybody all of a sudden you needed it, right? You, you lived for decades without it and then without a cell phone and now you can't live without a cell phone. You can't do anything without a cell phone. So how does that work in the music industry? Your intellectual property is the music you write. You create intellectual property and you get it into the marketplace. And that intellectual property generates income, revenue streams in multiple ways. There's the physical sales. There's um, licensing fees. And there's performance royalties. And now there are some newer ones that have come up in the past maybe decade or so where if you're the, you're, you get your music on a digital platform like Sirius XM, if you are a performer on the recording or you are the rights holder to the recording, the, own the copyright to the recording, you can get royalties from that as well typically paid through something called sound exchange. The performance royalties are typically paid by a PRO. Does anybody know what a PRO stands for? Performance rights organization. Yes. Yeah, uh, Mark, uh, it'll, it'll be up on YouTube uh, tomorrow after, uh, in other words, it'll be broadcast live to YouTube and it'll just stay up on the Aaron Copeland School of Music YouTube channel. Um, Right, performing rights organizations. So can anybody name, there's, there's two big ones and a, and a smaller one in America. BMI, ASCAP, and like, oh, I don't, don't remember the third one. CSAC. S-C-S-A-K, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that was American. Yeah, and every country has one. And the thought is that if a entity takes your intellectual property and uses it to generate income that you have the right to share in some of that income. So for me, I write music that's been on, that gets on television often. At some point, over the last 10 years, I had like 30 or f 30 or 35 theme songs for network sports programming running. I had stuff on the Big Ten Network, the Madison Square Garden Network, um, SNY, Fox Sports, ESPN, Comcast Sportsnet, which is now the NBC Sports something or other. And literally, these themes, some of these themes were for recap shows. Like uh, here in New York on SNY, they have uh, Geico Sports Night. It's on after the baseball game. And all these regions across America have these network, a network of sports broadcasters. So Comcast Sportsnet has, uh, they co-own SNY, <clears throat> they co-own Nesson which is the Red Sox. They own uh, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Washington. Um, I think there's one in Dallas now, in the Colorado. There's one in, in, in San Jose in the Bay Area. There's one in the Bay Area. There's one in Los Angeles. There's one in Sacramento. So you can see that there's like 10 or 15 broadcast networks that they own, and they all do local sports recaps. And then the recap show gets repeated. It's, if it's, let's say it's on at 11 o'clock at night. It's a half an hour. And they go through the highlights of the local sports and the net national sports, whatever season it is. That show gets repeated at midnight, 1230, 1 o'clock, 130. It gets repeated six or seven or eight times a day. So 
with those 30, 30, 35 theme songs running, and a lot of them on those recap shows, I was getting four, 500 performances a day on television of my music, right? And each one of those things pays a, paid a little bit of money. And when you add them all up, it added up to I could actually just live on that, right, in the city and, and not, not have an extravagant lifestyle, but I could, I could live on that easily, no problem. That didn't take five minutes to develop. That took years of work to get to that point. But I worked professionally as a pianist on Broadway in the city for over 30 years. I wrote, I've been writing professionally for about 20 years, right? I, 35 years as a pianist, like some of the highest paying gigs in New York City, and 20 years of writing music for films and television. And in that time, I made five or six times the amount of money writing music for films and television than I did playing shows, maybe even more than that, right? So it's just less time and much higher payout because of performance royalties, because of intellectual property rights. And that's how you earn a living in this industry. Paul McCartney is the wealthiest musician in the world. He's, and I think I've mentioned this in this class before. I, 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 sometimes the semesters blend together and it's hard to remember who I talk to this stuff about. But Paul McCartney's net worth is almost a billion dollars. And a lot of that has come from the Beatles, but a lot of that has come from him purchasing publishing books so that anytime there's a high school production of Anything Goes or Grease or... A any kind of production of Greece, if it's on Broadway as a revival or anything goes as being done by Lincoln Center, he gets a taste. He owns publishing catalogs galore. And so he gets, that's, he, that's where he built his empire up from owning publishing. So instead of investing in the stock market with his Beatles money, he started buying publishing catalogs. I don't know who taught him how to do that, but it was incredibly brilliant. So let's um, take a look at this here. So this is up in our class material, so you can access this yourself. Okay. So the key to a song generating consistent royalties comes down to one word, usage. The more, Like I said with my sports themes, the more it's used, the more it's heard, and the more chances to earn royalties it receives. Most commonly, it's just a sh factor of sheer popularity. When a popular act releases a hit song, it's going to generate a lot of plays. That, however, can be fleeting. So, like, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, Who Let the Dogs Out? That was like a big song. Yes, Michael Jackson did own the Beatles publishing, not the songwriting. I'm going to explain that in a middle... In a, in, in, a, in a minute. Um, I'm just responding to some of the chat. Um, uh, so, like I said, who let the dogs out, right? It was a big song for a week, uh, two weeks. Do you hear that on the radio now? Right? There was this big song four or five years ago, Party Rock is in the house tonight. It was on Hyundai commercials with the big gerbils or hamsters or whatever they were. Like, is that on the radio now? Maybe. But you know what's on the radio every year? White Christmas. You know how many so you know how many times yesterday has been recorded? The song The Wait by uh, Robbie Robertson in the band? How many times that's been recorded? So having that big hit can be great, but it can be fleeting. The idea is to have something that will be what's called evergreen, meaning that it will be relevant for a long period of time. So holiday music, Christmas comes every year, Christmas parties, Christmas ads, Christmas movies, and many other things Christmas related that provide an excuse to play classic holiday music again. 
Soundtracks. When an already popular song is used in an equally popular movie or TV show, it can quickly find itself in a new tier of royalty earnings. So a pop song becomes the theme song for a television show, a hit television show like Friends. That person, the, the person who wrote that song, if they're smart, will never have to work a day again for the rest of their lives. The person who wrote the theme song for St Seinfeld, if they were smart, they would never have to work a day again for the rest of their lives if they didn't want to. Repetition, a big viewing audience, especially when it's on network TV. Then syndication, it's on for years and years and years and years. And popular TV or movie or TV show. So covers. The original recording of a song goes nowhere but finds life after a different performer releases their unique interpretation of it. So you write a song and you release it and nobody buys it. And then um, somebody who's really a big artist now records it. And then it becomes popular you still own at least part of the rights to that song you wrote. And that will generate you money. So for the example, be, the other example is that your song is so popular that many want, people want to do covers of it. And if it's a great song, so just think about all these people, they get to a certain, all these pop stars, they get to a certain age in their life and then they go and release the American Songbook. And they're, they're doing songs by Gershwin, Cole Porter, Jerome Kern. That stuff was written 190 years ago, right? And their great, great songs will always find an audience. And their estates are reaping in the rewards of that. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of songs here. These are the top 10 royalty generating songs today. Candle in the Wind by Elton John, right? Everybody knows that song. He did two versions of the song. Untimely Death of Two Iconic Women. The original was written for Marilyn Monroe, and then about 30 years ago in the 1990s, he re-recorded it for... Princess Diana when she died in the car crash. The second time through, it ended up being more popular because it was attached to a popular public person, Princess Diana. Chestnuts Roast, the Christmas song by Mel Torme and Bob Wells. How many recordings and how many performances? If you guys are jazz musicians, you probably all know how to play the Christmas song, right? And how many recordings of it? Ooh, Nat King Dole. That's really bad. I apologize for that. Sorry, my bad typing. <laughs> Nat King Cole made one of the most, you know, he, he, it was, he first recorded it. And it's been recovered hundreds of times. Tony Bennett, Bob Dylan apparently even made a cover of the Christmas song. Garth Brooks. So do you see, the song is written, Nat King Cole, Tony Bennett, Mel Torme probably sang it, right? So that's one category of singers. But then you have Bob Dylan and Garth Brooks singing it. Two totally different artists with a different following. So the song breaks into other categories of the music industry. Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison, which is a big hit song in the late 1950s or early 60s. But it became the title track in 1990 for a big Hollywood movie called Pretty Woman. And look at this, been covered from Van Halen, Al Green, and John Mellencamp. Okay, so you look at a song that in the 1980s was a massive hit, Every Breath You Take by The Police, written by Sting. Massive hit for The, for the Police. Massive. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing that song for a, a, a months, months, months. It was just constantly on the radio. 
Look at this. Eight weeks at number one. Then Puff Daddy used it on a notorious B.I.G. song, I'll Be Missing You, winning a Grammy. Another 7 million copies. So check this out. P. Diddy never got permission to use the sample. Sting sued, and he now receives 100% of the remixes publishing as well. <laughs> this one song is responsible for 25% of Sting's lifetime publishing earnings. Six, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Another one. Popular forever. I have library music that I wrote in 1998 for a holiday album that gets used, it's 22 years later. It's, it, it gets used now, still. Stand By Me. I don't, I, you know, for me, I don't, really, I don't really like this song, but it's a big hit. John G Lennon did it, which was, a, he made a big hit of it also, but the original was by Ben E. King. It was a hit. But look at this, covered over 400 times. Became the title track of a 1986 film based off of a Stephen King story. Unchained Melody. Ended up being recorded by over 650 artists in 500 different languages. The best known version by the Righteous Brothers in the 1960s. And it was used in the Oscar winning movie Ghost. 650 artists. You write a song, 500 languages, and 650 artists, right? That's, you know, you'd have to play a, 10 gigs a day for the rest of your life to, to not even scratch what that brings in. Yesterday by Lennon and McCartney. You've Lost That Feeling by Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, who wrote it, and Phil Spector is credited with writing it, but I doubt that he wrote any of that. He just as there was the producer of the original song by the Righteous Brothers, um, Phil, Phil Med, uh, Bill Medley, I think his name is, the singer. And he, he got his name on a lot of songs from being a producer. Look at this, covered 2,200 times. And White Christmas, the most recorded song by Irving Berlin. 100 million copies of this song. Bing Crosby's version for the movie Holiday Inn that remains the most popular. So, those are the 10 most popular, most recorded songs as of the day I made oh, in history, not just of this month, since, I've, since I made this chart. Okay, let's take a look at some money. The Christmas Song. 19 million for the composers and 38 million total. Pretty Woman, Roy Orbison, 20 million, earning between one and $200,000 a year in royalties, 50 years after he wrote it. Santa Claus is Coming to Town, 27 million for the composers. Stand By Me, 27 million. This is just royalties to the composers. Unchained Melody, 27.5 million. Yesterday, 30 million. You've lost that. Love and Feeling, 32 million. White Christmas, 36 million. And I made this five years ago. So you could just imagine these numbers are much higher now. White Christmas, 36 million over like 75 years. So you think about that, right? You could easily live very comfortably on that. Now, Royalties, a song is split up into two pies. All the money for a song. There's the songwriters and there's the publishers. It's kind of, it kind of, it's kind of unfair. Publisher is typically has been the record company or when they were writing sheet music, the person who published the sheet music they take half of half of your money up front that your your songs generate in terms of performance royalties and royalty other royalties and then there's the songwriters
you make the agreement to give up your publishing if you're going to be on a record label, right? Or for me, a work for hire. So for example, when I was writing library music and production music, part of the deal was that the production music company, like Killer Tracks, they would own the publishing and I would keep all the songwriters portion of the royalties. So they can't, for, nobody can force you to give up your songwriting royalties. And if anybody tries to get you to do that, the answer should be no in maybe a little bit more coarser terms. But um, don't ever give up your songwriters. And as much as you can, don't try to give up the publishing and ownership of your intellectual property. So a business strategy, right? In 2004, I wrote the score to an independent film called Unknown Soldier. And I, I might have talked about this before, so from repeating myself, I apologize. Uh, I had a budget of $4,000 to create the score. That was $4,000 for me to pay players. I wasn't mixing everything back then, so paid somebody to mix the score. And I had my own studio. Uh, I had a space in a larger recording facility on 40, 47th Street and 8th Avenue. So I had a room. So I had to pay my rent for my room for the month it took me to score the film. So basically, by the end of the month, I didn't make any money. I broke even. Right? It basically just paid for my expenses for that month. But what I did with them was I worked out an arrangement where I would give them a non-exclusive license to use the music in the film in perpetuity however they'd like, but that I would retain ultimate ownership of the music. So that meant that I could take that music and license it out elsewhere, put, get it into a television show. I could release it as an album myself and maybe get some cash from that. But the biggest thing was that I kept the songwriters and the publisher's share of performance royalties. So the film did very well in the independent film world. It was on, in film festivals all over the world, probably like 30, 40, 50 film festivals. And I don't think it was a great film, but what I think it did was it told a story in a way that independent filmmakers liked. It, it told the story of a young African-American kid whose father is living with his father up in Harlem and he dies, his father dies suddenly of a heart attack and the kid's out of, out in the streets. And it talks about how he coped with that. And he, there's a point where he gets in with a, a, a bad crew of people doing, breaking the law and dealing drugs or something. And he, he makes the decision to break from that. And right. So it, it was, it showed like a tragic situation that happens all too often and tried to shine a positive light on it. And it showed it in a way that was appealing to film festival judges. So it won the Los Angeles Film Festival, which is a big deal. And it won the Philadelphia Film Festival. And it was nominated for something called the Independent Spirit Award, which um, is like the Oscars for independent films. And it didn't win, but it got enough attention that Stars and BET purchased the film. But I still own the music, right? And it was on television eight, nine times Uh, yeah, yeah, Latoya, I'll do that. Remind me in the future. All right, keep that. I don't know if I have time to get into that today, but keep that question in the future and ask me again. Um, so it was on television about eight, six, four times a month for like four or five years. 
and I earned five or six times the amount of money in royalties that I did from getting paid up front. So it ended up being a good deal for me, right? I worked for a month and I earned $25,000, $30,000 over the course of like five or six years. That's pretty good pay for a month's work, right? So the way that that works is that you have to fill out something called a, a Q sheet, which we're, I'm going to teach you how to do in a later class. And then the production company that hires you has to attach the Q sheet to the film so that wherever it gets broadcast, the broadcaster then hands in the Q sheet with some more additional information like broadcast dates. And then the PROs, um, it's their responsibility to pay you. So, okay, so I have a question. What is the purpose? This is not film, but films are on television, right? You could write a film, a television film. Um, and there are many series now that are on cable that are like films. So you could end up doing that, hopefully, some of you. I wish success for everyone. <laughs> but what is the purpose of television? Anybody answer that question? Sell advertising. Thank you. To sell advertising. That is the sole purpose of television. That's the sole purpose of radio. So when you're selling advertising, can anybody venture, like different shows get different rates, right? So a highly rated television show charges more for advertising than something that's on at two in the morning on some on Lifetime or something like that, right? So what's the highest rated show on television every year? Super Bowl. Correct. NBA Finals. What was the second one? Dimitri? NBA Finals. NBA Finals. Uh, um, yes, but not like the Super Bowl is an international event. So is the NBA Finals now, but the Super Bowl... You know, you could have 40 or 50 million people watching the Super Bowl. A rating for a great television show now is like 8 million. Um, yeah, the NBA Finals have definitely a good rating. Uh, typical, typical, typical times. Better than baseball, for sure. Um, so, what happens is that the PROs, um, they... have a contracts with the networks where they can find out the amount of money that they've been paid in advertising revenues. And they work out a deal to get a percentage of that paid to the PRO. Might be something like 1%, right? Then they use these cue sheets and they figure out how many, how many minutes of music is on air and they divide that up and they come up with a payment by minute. And that's how you get your, get paid. Now, that being said, if your music's on the Super Bowl, you get paid more for a minute than if your song is, music is on a show that's on at three in the morning on Lifetime. If you write a theme song, you get paid much, much, much more. Like if you have music that's on in the background of a television show that's like underscore, that pays a certain amount of money. But a theme song will pay 10 or 15 times that per minute. And um, if you have a vocal song that's featured in a television show, that pays even more. So there are these different strata of payments, but that's the basic gist. And it's typically, if things are done correctly, it's on a nine-month Leg. So last week I got paid for music that was on the air in January, February, and March of this year. So that's sort of, for me, figuring this out really was an eye-opener, right? It completely changed my existence. Um, at a certain point, I got tired of playing piano in pits 
and I saw it as a dead end opportunity where I'd be miserable. I'd have a great job that I'd hate. I'd be thankful for it and I'd work as hard as I could, but I'd be miserable. And um, getting involved in this kind of work it may, changed my, my life on many levels. You know, it gave me financial security, but it also made me much happier as a person because I was being creative and I wasn't playing the same music every night for 10 years, you know, 350 nights a year for 10 years. Same music, very hard to play, very loud and um, very unsatisfying. So I hope that this is, this is the, unless you guys have questions on this, which I hope you do. Um, yeah, NCIS, that probably pays quite a bit of, uh, if you wrote the theme song for N NCIS, um, you probably don't ever have to wor work again. Yeah, that, that show's been on for 15 or 20 years, right? It's on at CBS. It's very highly rated. Um, yeah, so this is just, you know, a discussion, food for thought, plant a seed in your mind, and hopefully you can exploit this idea for your own benefit at some point in the future. Just remember that the basic concept of what I said is true, but the industry is constantly changing and you have to sort of develop this sense where you can look into the future and anticipate where the business is going by current trends and try to position yourself in a way where you're not left behind. So for example, and I don't want to be cruel, if you think that you're going to be, you're training to be an orchestra musician and that you're going to be in an orchestra, you're going to be left behind because the chances of you getting in an orchestra are, no matter how good you are, are very small. And many orchestras are closing down or having their weeks reduced. When I was in my 20s, there were dozens and dozens of orchestras all across America that had full, you know, they, they worked 40, 50 weeks a year. There's only a handful of those left that do that kind of work in the big, in the big cities. That would be Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dallas. But there used to be all these other symphonies like the Wichita Symphony and the Syracuse Symphony and the Rochester Symphony and the Buffalo Symphony, right? All, all these smaller cities had symphonies where orchestras where the musicians could work and maybe they would supplement uh, on the off weeks by teaching at the local colleges. That doesn't real, that, that paradigm doesn't work anymore. So those people are, are going to be left behind unless they learn some modern technology and start getting ahead of the curve a little bit. So, yeah, The Simpsons. Yep, that's another one. You know, my, my wife's um, father was friends with a guy named Hoyt Curtin from high school. They, then they, they, were, they stayed friends their whole adult lives. And Hoyt Curtin wrote uh, music that you know. He wrote The Flintstones, right? You guys probably know how to play The Flintstones. It's based on I Got Rhythm Changes. Um, he wrote Top Cat. He wrote um, all of the Hanna-Barbera cartoons in the 1960s. Right? Flintstones, that still gets recorded and played today. Right? Thelonious Monk. His music is like, I don't know, when did he die? In the 1990s? He wrote songs in the 1940s that are still played today and still taught in jazz programs still get recorded, right? So you have these things that are evergreen that last for a long time, and that's sort of the, yeah, Law and Order is another one. Yeah, right. So Pete Townsend, unbelievable. Who are you? That song, I can't believe, and uh, uh, Baba O'Reilly, I think is, is one of them. Yeah, the Jetsons, that's, yeah. uh, Ken, that's, uh, Hoyt wrote that. Yep. The Jetsons theme is a great, great one. All right, so... That's the study. That's the wrap of that. And let's get on to music unless there's some questions on that.
Okie doke. So in the class folder for today, there's sheet music, a lot of it. Okay. And then there's MP3s. Now, I'm going to start here. Great. With a bit of classical music. So, I hope I don't step on this too badly. You'll forgive me if I do. Uh, hold on. I got to get the... There we go. All right, so this is from the Well-Tempered Clavier. That's fugue number two in C minor. So let's keep that in our ears. Uh, hold on one second. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Okay, so that's a Bach invention. And this is a Bach fugue. Can, let's have a discussion about this part here. Does anybody know what that part of this fugue is called? Subject. Yes, that's the fugue subject. And what is this part of the invention called? Is that the exposition? Well, the exposition is the, up to the point where it gets to the five chord. That would be measure 12 on this one, right? So this is called, right here, that's called the motive. So you have the subject in the fugue, which is a longer form typically and more complex and the motive in the invention. Typically, the fugue subject is more complex and it can last a long time. It can last six, it can last eight measures, four measures. Typically, the invention motive Right? Right? Short. They're short. Motivic. Fugue subjects and motives share similar characteristics. They share the characteristics of having an easily recognizable, definable, idea that you can hear quickly, right? You could have a four, five, six voice fugue and you can hear that subject coming in, the beginning of it, in a dense texture because it's got something recognizable rhythmically, intervallically, and it's great for creating sequences, right? So if we look here at this fugue subject, we look right over in this area here. 
right? Oh, that's the second. Uh, no, right here I want to look at it, right here, right? Right, so you've got... Right, so you can create sequences with a part of the fugue with a motive that is within the structure of the subject. Okay? So how do we relate that to film music? The best film music, in my opinion, is music that is composed with what I call motivic composing. Film score is a unified piece with recurring themes and developed elements. So if, if we thought of the C minor subject as a film theme that... Right, that little figure there. Or even just... That recurs and is developed and transformed over the course of the piece. So, motivic themes are easily recognizable with elements that can be extracted and developed to fit the underscore of the story as it unfolds. The motive can drive the story. The, mo the motive can comment on the story. The motive can be something that's a dream like. It can be all of these different things if it's well constructed because your compositional skill, where you take these elements and you transform them to create the, psycho the mood, the psychology behind what's happening in the film better you are at doing that, the more successful you will be as a film composer. Right? The best songs have motivic composing. The ones that get played the most. Right? 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 The two song, two notes at the beginning of yesterday. My video might get blocked if I play yesterday, believe it or not. So I'm going to... I'll save that for another, another day and I'll cut it out. <laughs> My film got blocked. The, the class video last week got blocked. So I had to re-edit it and re-upload re it. So I want to avoid doing that extra work this week. So, but let's take a look at some film themes. Well-known. You know all of these. I'm just going to play the melody. So this is the Indiana Jones theme, right? Very recognizable. Let's take a look at this. So it's an eight bar phrase. One, two, three. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. My fault. There we go. I'm still getting the switcher thing together. I apologize. So uh, let's do the picture in picture again. Great. All right. So eight bar phrase. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, and eight. And let me make this a little bit smaller so you could see the end of it. Great. All right. So what's repetitive in this and motivic? Very, very simple. Um, ba -ba -bum. Exactly. Da 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 
da, 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 right? So if we think of that, he's got a, like a little comment. Bop, ba, da, bop, bop, ba, da. Bop, ba, bop, 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 ba, 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 right? You can, if I just talk the rhythm out, you can hear that the rhythm makes sense in terms of it being a conversation, right? Da, 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 da. Ba, ba, da. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Right? You can almost see that, like, that melody is very conversational. And most of the interesting action happens towards the end of the eight bars. So with this piece, what happens at the end of the eight, at, like towards the end, like on measure six, he goes up to that F in the melody and instead of harmonizing it with an F or a D minor chord, right? Is that the Neapolitan chord he brings in there? That flat two thingy? <laughs> Right? So that's... And then action on the cadence to lead us back to the next repetition of the melody. So we could look at this as in terms of bars, the pickup, Starting here, so it's a two bar phrase. Then another two bar phrase. Right, and then all of those things are related rhythmically, even though he waits to this, you know, then. That's almost like the chorus, of the, like of the hook. So even in orchestral music, you can have a hook. It's not just for pop music. You hear this song, and it does something that I call, it's a, it, it sort of has elements in it. There's something in this that I would call like the mnemonic. It's a memory aid. And there are several of them in this, Piece. It's the rep rep repetition of the rhythm, and it's this. Right? That mnemonic, your ability to make memorable things like that is another, will be another indicator of your success in this endeavor, right? Um, because the mnemonic brands, the franchise. Indiana Jones is a franchise. How many of them have there been? A dozen? Ten? Eight? I don't know. Star Trek. Well, Indiana Jones? There's four of them. Four of them. All right, but all right, let's okay. think about... They're going to make a fifth one. Think about Star Trek. Boom, ba bum 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 right? That's been on television show after television show after television show. Movie after movie after movie. It's a big franchise, huge franchise. It's got a recognizable mnemonic in the melody. <clears throat> Hold on one second. James Bond is a good example. Right. Do -do 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 James Bond theme. Yep, exactly. Fun fact on the Goldfinger theme, sung by Shirley Bassey in the 1960s. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin fame is playing the acoustic guitar on that track. True story. <laughs> Just figured I'd throw that little factoid in there, off tangential, off topic. Okay. Let's look at something completely different. Uh, let's let's actually take a you want to take a listen to the to the full orchestration of that? We do that. Listen to a little bit of it. Sure. Thank you. 
just wanted to play that opening there, right? You hear the music and the way it's set, and you automatically want to go on a, a crazy adventure with lots of crazy stuff happening. Um, for the first time, this kind of puts me in the mind of like the William Tell Overture. It's kind of giving me those vibes. Yeah, that, I could see that, yep. If you've never seen a live, a good orchestra play the William Tell orchestra, the Overture, it's an ama it's amazing. It's amazing. I spent a, a, a summer in Vancouver, like maybe in 1990, and I heard at an outdoor festival, the Vancouver or Symphony playing the uh, William Tell Overture, and I had a friend who was in the orchestra, and it was just, it was incredible. I mean, I still remember to this today just how exciting it was. And all I could think of was the Lone Ranger. <laughs> All right, so let's take a listen to um, Psycho here. So this is Bernard Herman. Okay, I, I want to get through a lot of these. I don't want to um, play the original bit too much. So there's, in this first bit, one first thing to notice is that there's something strange, there's something unusual about how this is constructed. So this is the, right? That's the melody there. But this whole thing, from here until the reiteration of the melody in octave higher, is five bars, right? So this whole thing is supposed to be unsettling. So not only is the music unsettling, but the number of bars is not what we're used to. Things are usually done in two, four, eight measure phrases. Here, he's got like a five bar bit. Or you could even think of it like a three bar bit from when the melody starts here. Right? And then comes back in there. So that's unsettling, but you have a very, very, very strong, recognizable motive. Anybody venture a guess as to what classical composer that's most like? Stravinsky. Stravinsky, but more... Bart Bartok? Yes, more like Bartok, right? Bartok wrote in cells and... Um, you know, motive, motivic composing, like, to the nth degree. But there's so much material here in the first five bars. Right? Right, that's another one. And then this here. Oh, sorry. Over here, oops, I'm sorry, right here. So in that first five bars, you've got so much material that can be developed. So like, let's take for example, that beginning. That's really powerful. It's one, one measure and a downbeat. What can you do with that? You can do all sorts of different moods with that, right? You can reiterate it exactly as it is. Right? Or something like... Right? You could take that chord voicing, that minor triad with the major seventh on the top and the fifth in the, in the bass. And you could do stuff even like...
right? So you can see already I'm just improvising different feels based upon just that material there. You could go on for days. There's so much strong stuff there. And that, that's, that's a great um, example of motivic composing. Yeah, then there's this other bit too in this. Let's let's play this a little bit longer because you got another another right here. That's another bit. Another bit, and now check this out. Right. Yeah, you can just see it's just filled, filled with incredible ideas. And it just drives and moves. But even in this, like when we, if we look at this music here, what's so cool about that is that, let's see if I can play this without embarrassing myself. Right? Right, and it's just, it likes that long line there. That could be, that could actually almost have a romantic feel to it if you, if you work at it a little bit, right? So you could take this motives and all these ideas and you could really just spread them out through the entire, um, through the entire film. Very old school. I talked about this a little bit last week, but let's listen to the original recorder recording of this. So that goes right into the film. Let's take a look at that. All right. So this just takes an idea and then transposes it down a whole step. So this song is A, A prime form, and it's 16 bars and 16 bars. Is there a little tag at the end that goes further? No. So if we look at this, many of you that are jazz majors, you've played this probably, this song, live. The same idea, a whole step down. So you have the first four bars are then repeated a whole step lower. Right, so in this area here, the melody's been going down, starting on this B and ending up a fifth lower on this E. 
And notice what's really cool about this is that the way he's got this harmonized is that it starts on the ninth and ends up on the sixth. Right? Ninth. Changes it. Ends up on the ninth. So that's a cool variation. And that's another really something that I don't hear enough of in today's music, which, you know, most of the graduate students that are jazz musicians, you play songs that have extended harmonic tones as part of the melody on strong beats, not just in passing. Um, you know, like... Prelude to a kiss, right? You start on the ninth, uh, the 13th, ninth, fifth, major seventh of the, of the chord that it's being harmonized with. So you get a similar feel here, and this was sort of the harmonic language of the 1940s. So much more sophisticated than the harmonic language in pop music today. Even though this is a film score, this became a popular hit. So, okay, so then what happens over here, once we get to the second eight, the melody starts gradually ascending. So the first half, it's kind of descending, and the second half, it's it, not, not a direct ascent, but it makes, makes its way up. Right, so kind of contrasting the direction there. Let's take a look at how he develops this in another cue here. Oops, I don't want that in iTunes. So, right, you just heard him bring the melody back in there. Contrapuntal. So you could see how in this piece he, he renders things, um, how, how he takes that theme and he sprinkles it out throughout that entire cue. Um, the review video of this class will not have crunchy audio. I am, I'm making a stereo recording of it, but I just turned down the piano level. Is that better? So hopefully that'll be better going forward. Okay, let's move forward a little bit. Uh, 
Oh, this is the full score. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Nope. All right, I just want to listen to this. Um, I do have a piano version of this somewhere. I'm not quite sure where it is. So let's go to... Okay, let's listen to the beginning of this. This is Michael Kamen from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, I guess it's called, right? So at that point, we're moving on to another section of this. So you can hear, again, lo lots of little motives that are connected together. It's got that rhythm, da 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 right? So a lot of the composing is, from my perspective, getting the rhythm right and then filling the notes in, you know? You have, like, da 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 You have that like short little thing, and then the notes that connect from there to the next one, they're important. So I'll cut this out if it gets blocked, but if I do yesterday. Right, so it's a two note motive. And there's a connecting scale. You hear you don't hear that kind of a melody here, but you hear that same technique in this kind of a track where he's got that rhythmic idea and then connecting it to the next iteration of that rhythmic idea on a different scale step. It's a really important concept about writing melodies. Let's listen to this. This is Honor, which is the main... So let me just... Uh... Get the sheet music for that up. So this is a television movie, The Pacific. Let's see, where is that? Uh, here we go. Great. Oh, come on. <laughs> and back.
All right. So for me, that theme is perfect for the, this series. You know, it really encapsulates the, the mood and the feeling of it. And right, that's that's the that's one of the motives. And then the other idea. There, I can't see it here. Right? That's just Now, again, it's like a conversation, the melody, right? But it's got this motive, a couple of motives. And then he changes that into half notes. Instead of it's, right? Sentence, answer, you know, the second, another sentence. Then, Somebody else might be saying another sentence, and then, right? So it almost becomes like a conversation between people, and I don't quite know how to teach that. I just know when I hear it, how it works, and it's what I try to do with my own melodic writing. So... In the Google, in the uh, Dropbox, and there is, um, for the class materials for today, you can just download that. There's all this material for you to look at and research. I do want to just play um, a, a couple of bits. Okay, so these are two theme songs of mine. This is the FIFA World Cup theme for Fox Sports. And you can see that I employ the same kind of writing.
uh, this is for the. This was on last summer. Uh, this has been on f uh, f the 2016 FIFA World Cup. I wrote this in the fall of 2015. And it was with the women, and it was used again in 2018. Not as often as in 2016, and then last summer, not the one that just finished, when the women won. U.S. women won again. It was used. It got like 2,500 performances over six weeks um, on television. So this is something that I wrote. Uh, again, in 2015, this is the ESPN Special Olympics World Games theme. And my friend Ken Freeman, I believe, well, he was in this. I'm not sure if he's, yeah, he's still here. Uh, he engineered this recording session and he mixed this. And we did this at Avatar, which is now the power station at Berkeley. And there's, it's um, a lot of my sampled instruments and 18 brass players overdubbed, or was it 19? three times so it sounds like a you know a lot of brass players but again you could see in my world cup theme that bum da da dum da 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 dum da 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 dum da da dum it's like a conversation and there's rhythmic continuity to the theme and it's how that little da 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 rhythm how it connects some of the longer and slower notes in there and it's that's sort of what i'm trying to get at and something you don't have to do melodic stuff. The psycho theme, that was not melodic. Well, that it was a melody, but it was not, it was very dissonant. Uh, so you can do it with all kinds of music. It's really a great technique. So let's listen to the to this. Same thing. This is a little different style. So this is still distorting. Is that true? Yeah, it's still through the. Uh, All right, hold on one second. At least through the video that we have. Okay, no problem. Let me see if I can do it this way. Yeah, Ken, you mix this too hot, man. <laughs> So I don't want to. I want to get into the next bit, and we're running a little bit uh, over. But again, with this, I've got that opening fanfare, and then into the melody. Bum 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 ba ba bum ba ba bum ba 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 bum. Right. It's it's similar to those similar concept uh, to those other things that I'm explaining, and I think it's really an important um, technique. So I'm going to post this up on Google Classroom, but the homework for next week is to compose. Uh, undergraduates, you do three of these, and graduates, you're going to do five of these. So five 30-second cues in different styles using motives as the basis for the material. You can choose something that's drama, adventure, thriller, romance, comedy. They, they can be five different motives 
They could be 20 seconds long, 25 seconds. It's, it's fine. I just wanted you to get used to creating some motives and unfolding them into a little bit of a more expanded idea. Um, you can orchestrate it if you want. You can do it just for piano if you want. The idea is to get the content correct. All right, I'm going to post this up on our Google Classroom so you'll be able to read exactly what I want. I'll do that uh, tonight. So five five motives on anything, like just creating five different... Yeah, but, you know, like I have some moods here. Drama, adventure. So what kind of a mode? So psycho. Right? Okay. That, that's... Yeah. yeah you know? Uh, Robin Hood, it's adventure. Honor, it's like, you know, proud few of the proud the many the marines right um romance what's like laura that's romance so i've got these categories here comedy whatever whatever it is i don't know um that's for you to decide and it, it can be about 30 seconds long i just want you to get into the idea of starting to think about writing music like this and attaching it to an emotion or a style of film, right? It's not just abstract. It has to fit in with whatever you're doing. So I'll type all this out, and I've got it typed in the, in the syllabus, but I'll type it and put it on Google Classroom so that it'll be easier for you to um, reference. Okay, so that brings us to the next fun bit. And before this distorts, let me do this. Now, all right, so you guys are just starting out doing this, and you might not have a large amount of sounds to choose from. So if you're doing this in a notation program, you just have probably what comes for the notation program, if you're using Logic, most of you probably only have the sounds that come with Logic. Maybe you've got a couple of other outside libraries. And my point here is twofold. There are free libraries out there that you should download into your computers if you really want to get serious about this. And I've got, I'm going to post this up on uh, on our Google Drive. I've got links here. Okay. And you should also learn how to create sounds from scratch or to take pre-existing sounds in the software that comes with your DAW and enhance them and make them better and make them live. So I'm going to play you a cue that I wrote. And this is using a library called the BBC Orchestra from Spitfire Audio. This is the Discover version. They make three levels. They make the Discover version, they make just the regular version, and they make the professional version. This, they're selling for $49, but if you're a college student, when you purchase it, you write to them, and, or, and, and they'll, you wait a week or two, and then they'll give it to you for free. Okay, so this is... It's not a perfect library, but I think for some of you, this might be a big step up from what you're currently using if you're writing orchestral music. One question. How do you add? I, I got a BBC library, but then how do you add it to the Logic library? Right. So you have to install it. And in Logic, you have to add it as an instrument. In a, a Spitfire, it comes in its own player. Uh, the VST. Okay. Uh, well, it's an AU in, in Logic, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You save it as a channel strip. However you set it up, you save it as a channel strip. Yeah, I, you know, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my computer right now. I could open up Logic and show you, but Mark uses Logic, and he probably knows it better than I do, and I would take his... Uh, when you open up an instrument track, right, you have to look for the... In the, in the um, inserts, you would have to go to an AU... Um, in, in instrument and it'll be listed in there. You could, th I think that they have at their website, they've got uh, instruction, like tip videos that they link to about how to set it up in all different DAW. 
they they have templates too for yes, that's logic correct. Correct. And and all the others. They have templates you can download and it's like preset for your program. Correct. And what's good about this is if you guys write stuff using this and you send me either a logic or I have logic, Cubase, Performer, and Pro Tools in my computer, I can open it up in any of those and I could play it with the full the full version, which has more dynamics, more articulations. But let me just show you. It comes, this is the player that it comes with. And it's this this is just uh, tenor trombones, uh, three short. Oh, these are long. Oh, hold on a second. I want to. Uh... Oh, you're not seeing that. Sorry. There we go. I have to be a television producer as well as a uh, educator. <laughs> it's kind of difficult. Okay. So let me quit out of the ivory. It's still sounding. Let's see, right here, too belong. And then, let me just show you something. Right, so if I play this note, I have this controller set up where I can use this slider and play in dynamics with the long notes. I, that's something I'll teach you a little bit more of later, but let's just do this right now. So let me just, I'll just play this. This is something I whack together in a, in a couple of hours. You can hear that, that's not distorting. Great. How was the volume on that? It was better? The volume was, uh, was low, but it wasn't much distorting at all. Okay, I, I think I turned it down a little bit. A little bit. Uh, this is not mastered, so it's probably not as hot as the other things that I was playing, you know what I mean? So, because uh, it was really soft for me. So that's done with a free library, right? It's a great demo, you know, as far as for students, I think it's really useful. They also have this thing called labs, which I'll show you in a second. So I'm going to close this out. This is going a little slower than normal. My computer's, it's, it's, I've got the air conditioning on. It's like sort of, the fan is going, it's cool. It's a little uh, throttling from being so over, uh, hot. Okay, so they also make this thing called Labs. And Labs is sort of a repository of all, and this is totally free. And it's a repository of experiments they've done. And one thing it has that would be really useful for some of you is it has recordings of performances, right? So so that's a cello, right? It's a harmonic cello. Right, and you can't get that sound from a, most libraries, and you sprinkle that in, odd sounds like that. I mean, you can look here. 
uh, strings. So let me do this, and you can watch my right, left hand in action here. Right, and so you can, using these dynamics here, you can play things in. So the bit here being that Automate to animate. When a violinist or any acoustic instrumentalist plays an instrument except for a piano or marimbas, the sound as it's unfolding in time is animated, right? They've got their fingers on the strings, the bow going across the strings, their mouth and the mouthpiece are on the reed. They're animating the sound as it is unfolding. It's not static. And that's the problem with writing for samples is that it can be incredibly static unless you really start automating things like uh, things like this bit here, where I'm holding that note out and I'm changing the dynamics. So if you get sounds like, and it has this has some other really cool sounds, like it has this really, uh, let's see. This is an Asian instrument called a moon guitar. So you see, when I play it hard, it has a different articulation. They're a little bit too uh, jarring. You'd have to edit that a little bit, but just you should just download all these. They're free. They're really useful. If you get the contact player from Native Instruments, it comes with a bunch of libraries. This is one of them. And then again, you see this knob here. Oh, let's see, I can do this. Learn MIDI CC automation, and I can do this one. And then I can use the cutoff filter, which I'm going to show you in a second, to animate that sound in real time. And this has a bunch of different sounds here. Let me go to another one. So this is these are all on the the PDF I'll post. So this is a duduk, which is a, a an ethnic instrument, wind instrument. Has nice reverb. That might be a little too wet. All sorts of stuff that they give away. And they want to get you into the ecosystem. You don't have to, but you can take advantage of the stuff that they are offering for free. Now, this is an instrument called Expand. It comes free with Pro Tools. It's a tired. <laughs> it's tired. It's it hasn't been updated in a, over a decade. It's called a Rompler, which means that. All the sounds are stored in read-only memory, and you can't load any more new waveforms or samples into it. But it has some basic controls where you can take the sounds and enhance them and go beyond the programmed sounds. So this is a, a pad I made, right, with a, a female voice in it. Right. 
that's a beautiful sound made in expand, right? Which is a, a really not considered a high quality rompler. Um, but with a little ingenuity, you can do stuff. So let me show you quickly what I did here. This comes with a pre bunch of presets, right? So I picked, and then you can also load sounds into these four slots here. So I added this polysynth right here, which is just called Simply Nice. I'm just soloing that now. And then what I did was I went here and I played around with the cutoff. I turned it all the way up. I added some reverb and some delay. And then here, this is a female ooh pad. So with this one, I, the attack was much shorter. I opened up the attack and I added the more breath here. So these knobs over here, these functions change depending upon the sound. So there are, so I'm performing synthesis using the sampled sounds that are in this as waveforms, as the basis of creating new sounds. So if all you can learn is how to control an envelope and filter, you can do a lot of sound designing. So most of these synthesizer type things have a low pass filter. That historically was first, as far as I know, introduced into the Moog synthesizers, um, the Moog modular synthesizers in the 1960s. And that's the most famous filter. It's a, I think it's a 24 decibel per octave low pass filter with four poles and it creates a very rich sound. And basically you can sweep it so that a low pass filter attenuates the high frequencies of a sound and it allows the lower frequencies to continue through and you can adjust the, the filter, the frequency with which the, the, the sound, the pitches are, the frequencies are attenuated. So in other words, you could, if I were to play this sound here, right, I've turned the cutoff filter all the way up. That means you can hear all the breathiness. I bring it down, it's attenuating those higher frequencies and allowing the lower frequencies to continue the sound. So you can do a lot of really interesting things just with understanding cutoff filter and resonance. Resonance not here, but what resonance is, is an emphasis of the frequency that the cutoff filter is set at. And it creates like wowish and wow kinds of sounds. Um, there's, there, there might be another sound where I can explain that in more detail. Now, an envelope has to do with volume and time. There are four standard, again, in, invented by Dr. Moog, who, as I've probably mentioned, went to Queens College um, as an undergraduate student. Dr. Moog created, for his modular synthesizers in the 60s, something called an amp, amp envelope, adjusting the volume of the amplifier. It has four stages, attack, decay, sustain, and release. The attack of a sound is the amount of time it takes for a sound to get from no volume to full volume. No volume to full volume. So right here, I have an attack. So I'll turn it all the way off. Right? Let me turn it so that's the slowest. And you see how much time it's taking to get to full volume? That's the attack. Decay is the amount of time it takes from full volume to get down to the next bit, which is sustain. Sustain is time. It's, the, it, it's a static volume. So you have attack, decay, and then for as long as you hold the note out, it will sustain at a particular volume. So sustain is actually more time than level-based. Then once you release the note, the amount of time it takes to get from the level, the volume of the sustained note to no volume is called the release. So I could show you the release here. 
let me make the attack a little faster and turn up the cutoff. So let me do this so you can see my hand. So I play the note and I let go and it stops, right? I turn the release up and it continues on afterwards. So just knowing some of these techniques and how to layer sounds together, you can create some really interesting timbres. So let's listen to this one here. So this is a celeste, a big soft pad, and a suitcase Rhodes, and I've got some effects. And let me see if I've done anything under the hood. Yes, I've changed it some, some of the... Okay, let me play the sound. Right, so you hear how the sound unfolds and changes over time. I'm holding the sustain pedal. Right? So let's listen to the three parts. I'm turning them off. So this is the celeste. That doesn't sound like a celeste, does it? Well, see what I've done on the master controls, the attack, the decay, and the release are way up. Well, the attack is way up, right? So instead of it being, that's a celeste. Oops, sorry, that's probably distorting. Right, and up here, that's, I haven't checked it there. So the cutoff, I could make it darker if I wanted. Let's listen to the big soft pad. Oh, it has to be on. Sorry. Okay, so this one has resonance. Let me show you about the resonance. So I'm going to open the cutoff filter a little bit. You hear that kind of... That's the resonance emphasizing the frequencies that the cutoff filter is set at. So you get that wow-ish kind of a sound, right? I like that. I'm going to leave that. Let me mute this and turn on the electric piano. I've softened the attack. I've turned the cutoff down. There's some chorus and tremolo on this. And I've also done similar things with the envelope here. And then all three together create an aggregate sound. And if this one is too loud, I could just bring the volume of that down a little bit so it blends in a little better. So, this is a, a Wurlitzer electric piano, right? What, you can't hear this because Zoom is in mono. But I wanted to make this a little wider, so I put a, one Wurlitzer in this slot and a different one in this slot here, and I panned one all the way to the left and the other one all the way to the right, so it gives it a little bit of width, right? So it just seems a little bit more spread out in the stereo field. And then I have it programmed so that if I turn up the mod, I get a little vibrato. This is actually tremolo. And I did that over here in the mod area. And I've got a triangle wave, and I've got it affecting volume, and I set the rate and the depth here, and I have it being controlled by the mod wheel, which I have assigned here on this. So these are this is a little bit more advanced, but I'm just showing you that if you start learning about this stuff, so this is 
another pad that I created with all these four different layers. So let's take a listen to this. See that? How many different things come in? Uh, so I'm going to play a chord, and I'm going to hold it down with the sustain pedal, and I'm going to play around with some parameters here. I think I have CC2 as the filter cutoff. Okay, so I've got that programmed here. So, again, an, an amazing sound, right? Just really amazing sound made with a tired, from my perspective, a tired sound source. So you notice I'm playing one note, and you're hearing a chord. So what I've got here are four sawtooth waves, which is a sound that has an equal amount of even and harmonic um, overtones at equal volumes above the fundamental. I've got the first one panned a little bit to the right, the second one panned a little to the left, the third one a little more to the left, and the fourth one a little bit more to the right. So what I've done to this sound is I've gone over here to the fine tuning. This one is... So let me turn these off, these other three. That's the root note. You can see this next one I've got tuned to minus 12. So you hear they're in octaves. This one is plus five. That's a fourth. I gotta make sure I say the right thing. So it's a fourth above the top one and an octave and a fourth above this one. And then I've got one at plus seven, which is seven semitones, which is a fifth. So it's a sustained, it's a suspended chord. And then I've got something set up with the mod wheel. add a pulse to it. And I've done that over in this area here, right? I've done a square wave on it, on the filter. And I can, this is beyond the scope of this class, but my point being is that you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a, create your own sounds that are really interesting. So this is a percussive sound. So it's a mallet. It's an electric piano attack. Really? Hmm. I don't know why that's not sounding. Interesting. I don't know why this one isn't sounding anymore. Oh, my fault. Okay. So let's hear this one. So that's just the attack of an electric piano. Kids cartoon? Make your own sounds. Yes, you can make Zoom stereo, but it doesn't, 
I've tried doing it with people in class. It doesn't work unless everybody, from my perspective, unless everybody has a paid um, subscription. All right. So um, any questions on any of that today? That's quite a bit of information. A jam-packed class, <laughs> so to speak. All right. So the big thing to get is um, a little bit about the business of this practice, this career. Talked about motivic composing and how it works. There are all those MP3s and scores. I would download those and just listen to the music. Get this, get the ideas in your ear. You know. Um, yeah, just learn the language of film music. There, there's, it's, there's so much that you that can be created that's not been heard yet. But the principles that are found in film music work for a reason. And they're the same whether it's an electronic score like in The Social Network or a film noir score from the 1940s like Laura. The same principles underlying film scoring work in all that music. And then the final thing today is, you, I'm not expecting you to do this this semester, but it's just a taste of, at some point, you're going to have to learn how to do some synth programming. And right there, I just stacked sounds and use the filter and the envelope really and some basic modulation that's not very difficult to learn to create some world-class sounds from a tired rompler you know and those are things that you want to have an original sound you know you want to be able to create something that's uniquely yours um following some of these principles that we've been talking about but create a sound that's your own um yeah so that's basically it for today, and I will p try to get the video up, the review video up on Friday, and um, I will go over your assignments before the, try to get that done by the weekend also, before Sunday this time. Oh, what was I using to control the parameters? This, I have a better one with, with longer faders, which is easier to use, but this is a cheap Korg Nano Control too. I think they're like 40 bucks or something like that. And it works perfectly fine. And what I did, yeah, let me just show you this. Hold on. Okay. So this is a Nor Korg Nano Control 2. And what I've done is there's software that comes with it. And it's very easy to assign what are called MIDI CCs to every one of these knobs and faders. And since I'm so organized, which that's a joke, by the way, I've got a little label under each one of these telling me what MIDI CC it does and what function it does um, in most of the synth software that I use and on the top the same thing and then I've got a few on the top that are unassigned they have no MIDI CCs to them but I can assign them uh, by typically right clicking on a control in most software if it's in record you can twist these knobs and it will respond to that so I can quickly assign uh, a, a knob to do something which is in real time, which is much better than going back afterwards and tweaking with a mouse. So it's a little USB device. It's powered from USB. I, I can't live without it, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I can't live without it. It's really cool. So, all right. So I will see you guys next week. Everybody have a great weekend. And I'm looking forward to looking at your assignments. Thank you all for coming and staying for the entire time. I hope I've kept you entertained somewhat. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great day, everyone. All right, man. Have a good night, man. Bye. Uh,